Here's hoping we don't run into any more technical difficulties. Let's go ahead and do my sound check and see if I can see things moving. Yep. Okay, we are good to go. And for once, I'm actually on time for this. So, yeah, let me put away my headphones and let's get started. Oh boy, it's been an exhausting week. AP exams are finally over, so that's the saving grace. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on whose perspective we're looking at, I'm not going to get as much free time as I thought I would get this summer because I already have two students that are looking into uh, doing some uh, summer tutoring with me and I'm sure more requests will uh, come along later. My plan for this summer is to just teach myself a lot of things. I've mentioned in previous sessions, I'm pretty sure, that I'm... Uh, actually, I don't know if I've mentioned it before, that I'm going to be working on just reteaching myself Blender so I can make uh, 3D models and animations for uh, physics especially. So that's something I'm planning to do. And other than that, I'm going to be reviewing some of my uh, math courses so that I can offer more math. I have taught multivariable calculus before, but it has been a couple years since the last time I taught it, so I figured this would be the best place to start. So today, that's what I will be doing. I will be uh, reviewing some multivariable calculus, starting with just vector stuff. So what I'm going to use this time instead of my physical textbook, I'll probably alternate between the physical textbook and this digital one. Uh, this digital textbook that I'm going to be using is the uh, Calculus Volume 3 book from OpenStax, which you can download for free. Of course, if you uh, want to, they will give you the option to offer a donation and support the uh, volunteers who create these materials for people. So if that's something you believe in and want to support, you can do that. Uh, but otherwise, you can just download a copy and have it with you. I'm using a version that I downloaded years ago, so it may not be the most up-to-date, so if you download a copy and you see questions that are different from what I'm doing, then that explains the reason for the difference. Anyway, without further ado, let me get started. So before any actual calculus uh, can be done in multivariable calculus, we need to get comfortable with vectors. We need to get comfortable with vectors, and you also need to be good with your uh, parametric equations and polar coordinates. And it wouldn't hurt to know your conic sections too, but I'm going to skip over that. That's what they cover in the first chapter of Volume 3. But I don't really need to review that. I'm not entirely sure I need to review vectors either, but I'm just going to look at some questions, and if I get stuck on something, then I'm probably going to scroll back, do a little bit of reading, and remind myself whatever it is I'm forgetting. So I'm skipping to, if you're following along in the book, the exercises of section 2.1. And I am given, for the following exercises, consider points P negative 1 comma 3, point Q, which is 1 comma 5, and point R, which is negative 3 comma 7. And it says determine the requested vectors and express each of them 
in component form and by using the standard unit vectors. In component form and by using standard unit vectors. Okay, so I might skip some of these. The first one they want is the vector PQ. And I see since we've only got two values for each point, I see that these are going to be two-dimensional vectors that we're working with, but we'll come across the three-dimensional vectors later. So the vector, B, the vector PQ in component form is going to be, let's see, from P to Q, the displacement from P to Q. In the horizontal direction, we've got 1 minus negative 1. 1 minus negative 1. And in the vertical, we've got 5 minus 3. 5 minus 3 equals 2 comma 2 in component form. And using standard unit vectors, we can also write that as 2 i hat plus 2 j hat. Now, if you're one of my physics students, then this might seem completely foreign to you because you've never seen me uh, write vectors in this form, unless you looked at some of the electromagnetism videos I did, particularly the first one that I did like two months ago, the first Office Hours with Al video ever. But yeah, this is another uh, this is another way to uh, write vectors. Essentially, uh, what you need to know if you're confused is it's almost like you're writing coordinates, except instead of these numbers being coordinates, these are components. So the first coordinate is the uh, x component, the second coordinate is the y component, and later on we will see uh, vectors with a third component, which is the uh, Z component. And yes, you can uh, come up with uh, vectors that go higher than three dimensions, but uh, we're not going to be dealing with that. At least I don't think we will. For the most part, we're sticking to two or three dimensions for multivariable calculus. Although a lot of the things that we can do in two and three dimensions still work in higher dimensions, so we might get the occasional higher dimensional problem. Anyway, this is known as component form. Instead of parentheses, you use angle brackets to indicate that these are components of a vector and not points. Two comma two means a vector that has two units in the x direction and two units in the y direction, so overall that vector looks like this, assuming that assuming that, that is your coordinate system. This is the vector 2 comma 2, and because 2 comma 2 is not a point, it doesn't matter where you draw this vector in two-dimensional space. I could draw it here and it's still 2 comma 2. I could draw it with its tail at the origin and it would still be 2 comma 2. It doesn't matter where I draw it. Vectors don't really have a uh, position that they're necessarily connected to, unless they are a position or displacement vector. Then usually they'll be defined relative to some point in space. So what about this i hat j hat business then? Well, i hat is simply defined as a vector of magnitude 1 in the uh, x direction. i hat, the vector i hat is simply equal to 1 comma 0. Or in three dimensions, you can also say it's 1 comma 0 comma 0. And j hat is going to be the vector 0 comma 1. Or in three dimensions, it would be 0, comma 1, comma 0. 
no x component, 1 for the y component, 0 for the z component. And if we take a look at this, then we can actually justify this. We can say 2 times i hat, which is 1 comma 0, plus 2 times j hat, which is 0 comma 1. You can distribute uh, the 2's any constant outside of uh, the angle brackets of a vector can just be distributed over the components. So we get 2 times 1 and 2 times 0. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 times 0 is 0. Plus over here we've got 2 times 0 is 0 again and 2 times 1 is 2. And if I add those uh, as you could probably guess just through intuition, you just add components to each other. Not too different from what we do in physics. In physics, we, uh, when we want to add multiple vectors, what we do is we break them into their uh, components, and then we add components that are uh, along the same axis. We add the x components to the x components, and the y components to the y components, and then we recombine them into one final vector. So, yeah, uh, x component of 2 plus an x component of 0 equals a total x component of 2. And y component of 0 plus a y component of 2 gives you a total y component of 2. And if you want to take it all the way and uh, actually just calculate the magnitude of a vector and the angle it makes, with uh, a given direction, then that can be done in a fashion very similar to what you learned in uh, physics. Actually, exactly how we did it in physics. You would do Pythagorean theorem, and you would say square root of the first component squared plus the second component squared. Square root of, I guess we'll call it vx squared plus vy squared gives you an overall magnitude of square root of 2 squared plus 2 squared. So 4 plus 4 equals square root of 8 for the magnitude. And for the direction, you can just use, well, in two dimensions, you can just use inverse tangent of the second component over the first. In three dimensions, it's not so easy. In three dimensions, it's uh, not as easy, and that's actually a good reason to start adopting this notation for vectors when, transi when transitioning to three dimensions. Because defining vectors as just a magnitude and an angle is not very convenient in three dimensions. Okay, so all that explaining out of the way, is there anything else I need to do here? Uh, no, I think I've answered the question. So that's the vector PQ. They also want you to uh, come up with the vectors PR and QP and RP, which are going to follow a similar process. Whichever uh, point is named first, that's going to be the initial point. Whichever point is named second will be the terminal point, and you'll do terminal point minus uh, initial point for the x and y components. So I don't think I need to repeat that. Uh, number 5 says PQ plus PR. I might want to do that. Well, I guess that means I'd have to find PR. Okay, we'll find PR. PR, vector PR is equal to, let's see, we've got 7 minus 3, oh, that's for the Y component. I'm thinking in terms of uh, slope, which is why I'm doing Y components first. That's not good. brain acting on autopilot. 
I've been doing slopes of best fit lines with students in preparation for the AP Physics exam. That's why I've been hearing that today's AP Physics exam was uh, more difficult in the multiple choice section, but s uh, surprisingly easy for the free response. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing as far as my students are concerned, but I guess I'll hear from them when I hear from them. Anyway, back to this. PR negative 3 minus negative 1. Comma. Uh, 7 minus 3. 7 minus 3. That's going to be negative 4. Or no, negative 2 comma, 7 minus 3 is just going to be 4. And in terms of standard unit vectors, also sometimes called standard basis vectors, that would be negative 2 times i hat plus 2 times j hat. Wait, what? No, plus 4 times j hat. Where did I come up with the 2? Plus 4 times j hat. Brain malfunctioning. Okay, now that I know PQ and PR, number 5 says what's PQ plus PR? What's PQ plus PR? PQ plus PR is as simple as PQ was 2 comma 2 plus PR is, where did it go, negative 2 comma 4. I was blocking it with my hand. Equals 2 plus negative 2, that's going to be 0. And 2 plus 4, that's going to be 6. Equals, well, 0 i hat and just 6 j hat. I mean, you can write the plus 0 i hat if you want, but you don't need to. It's kind of like how you don't have to write the 1 in front of 1x. Uh, Okay, number six is PQ minus PR. That's not going to be too different. It's just subtracting. Whoops. Uh, P, P, Q minus PR. Two comma two minus negative two comma four equals, that's going to be 2 minus negative 2 is 4, and 2 minus 4 is negative 2. Equals 4 i hat plus, or I guess minus, plus negative 2 j hat. Okay, next one is 2PQ minus 2PR. So the next one is asking for 2PQ minus 2PR. Is that still visible on the screen? Yeah. 2PQ minus 2PR. Since both are being multiplied by 2, you can just factor out the 2. You can you can apply the distributive property in either direction, either distribute something outside a pair of parentheses or factor constants out when multiplied by vectors. That's perfectly allowed. So we can just do two times the PQ minus PR that we 
got earlier. P R. which is two times we got four comma negative two. equals 8 comma negative 4 or in terms of standard unit vectors 8 i hat I was going to write plus again minus 4 j hat there we go that's better Come to think of it, I guess I haven't really defined unit vectors. I mean, you can probably guess from the name, a unit vector, and we'll talk about how to get a unit vector later. A unit vector is a vector whose magnitude is exactly one unit. Has magnitude of exactly one. The standard unit vectors are uh, the ones where only a single component contains all the magnitude of the vector and all the other components are zeros. You can certainly have unit vectors that are not along the directions of x, y, or z. The only condition is that the square root of x component squared plus y component squared must be 1. So, for example, uh, 0 0.6 comma 0.8 is actually a unit vector, because if I do 0 0.6 squared plus 0 0.8 squared and take the square root, I get a magnitude of 1. 0 0.6 squared would give me 0.36 plus 0.8 squared would give me 0.64 and that adds up to exactly 1 and the square root of 1 would be 1 and if you're wondering about the negative square root magnitudes are defined as absolute values so uh, we would just take the positive root when doing this calculation you're essentially calculating the length of your vector and negative length doesn't really make sense now does it? But we'll do more with unit vectors later. Uh, number 8 says 2pq plus 1 half pr. I think at this point you have enough understanding of how that would work out. Just uh, well okay I'll do it. I'll do it on the next page so let me grab another sheet. pq minus one half pr is just going to be two times what was pq two comma two minus one half and then pr was uh, negative two comma four. So we've got 4 comma 4 essentially minus, I guess, negative 1 comma 2 is how you can think about it. So 2 times 2, 4 minus half of negative 2, so plus 1, 4 plus 1, that should be 5. And then 2 times 2 again, so that's 4 minus half of 4, so minus 2. 4 minus 2, that should be 2. And in terms of standard unit vectors, that's 5i hat plus 2j hat. And 
numbers 9 and 10 say find the unit vector in the direction of PQ and the unit vector in the direction of PR. I'll just find one of them. So how do we get a unit vector when your vector already clearly has a magnitude greater than 1? How do we get a unit vector out of a vector that already has a magnitude greater than 1? Uh, PQ, we already calculated the magnitude of it earlier, so I guess we can use that one. I think I'd rather do PR though. Yeah, let's do PR. So the magnitude of PR, depending on the book you use, sometimes uh, you'll see different notations for it, but magnitude of a vector can be represented by putting that vector in either single absolute value bars or a lot of textbooks I see will use double absolute value bars. So let's get the magnitude of PR. PR was 4 comma, where was it? Or no, negative 2 comma 4. PR was negative 2 comma 4, so the magnitude of PR is going to be the square root of negative 2 squared plus 4 squared. So that's going to be the square root of 4 plus 16. That's going to be square root of 20. Or the square root of 4 times 5, which can also be written as 2 square root of 5. Did I do all my math right? 4, 16, 20, 4 times 5, 2 root 5. Yep. Okay, so I've got the magnitude of PR, and why do I need the magnitude? Well, if I have a, if I have a vector whose magnitude is greater than 1, then all I have to do to turn its magnitude into 1 is divide it by whatever magnitude it has. If a vector has a magnitude of 4, if I divide it by 4, its magnitude becomes 1. If I have a vector of magnitude 12 and I divide it by 12, I get a vector of magnitude 1. That's the idea. A unit vector is simply going to be the uh, vector that you have, whatever vector you have, divided by its magnitude. Divide a vector by its own magnitude and you get a unit vector and that unit vector will be in the same direction as the vector you started with. So the unit vector for PR, what would I call this? I guess I'll call it U. of PR is equal to the vector PR itself divided by the magnitude of PR equals, let's see, where was it? It was 5? No, not 5 comma 2. Negative 2 comma 4. I could have gotten that just from looking at this. I don't know why I had to turn the page like that. I guess this is why I'm reviewing. But we have negative 2 comma 4 divided by 2 root 5. And dividing by a constant is the same as multiplying by a constant. You can think of this as 1 over 2 root 5 times negative 2 comma 4. If I distribute 1 over 2 root 5, then let's see, negative 2 over 2 root 5 becomes negative 1 over root 5. And then 4 over 2 root 5, the 4 and the 2 reduce, and I end up with 2 over root of 5. Or if you want, uh, if you want it in terms of standard unit vectors, you can say 
negative 1 over root 5 i hat plus 2 over root 5 j hat. OK, does this thing actually have a magnitude of 1? If you do the square root of 1 over root 5 squared plus 2 over root 5 squared, what do we get? If I do the square root of negative 1 over root 5 squared plus 2 over root 5 squared, then we get, well, the negative 1 squared is just 1 over the root of 5 squared is 5 plus 2 squared is 4 over the root of 5 1 squared is 5 1 fifth plus 4 fifths that is indeed 1 so yeah we're getting a magnitude of 1 just in case you were not convinced That takes care of number 10. Let's see what other interesting questions they might have for us here. And I need to keep remembering to check the position of my paper so that it's actually within the field of view of the camera. Oh, I just noticed your chat message. You need help with your calc exam. Uh, if you're asking me to help you while you're taking an exam, I can't do that. But if there's a particular topic you would like to review, just let me know. Let me see, is there a way for me to check the time this was posted? Doesn't look like it unless I'm Hmm. Yeah, I guess I can't see the time on this page. I'll have to look into that later to figure out uh, how chat works because I haven't really gotten used to working with chat yet. But yeah, uh, feel free to uh, post a topic and we can have a look at it. I can come up with examples. Until I see an update, I'll just continue with the problems that I have in front of me. Now, where was I? Number 11 says a vector v has initial point negative 1 comma negative 3 and terminal point 2 comma 1. Find the unit vector in the direction of v. Express the answer in component form. Okay, so we've already done that. We don't need these. 12 looks like the same type of problem. 13 says the vector v has initial point uh, p1 comma 0 and terminal point Q that is on the y-axis and above the initial point, find the coordinates of terminal point Q such that the magnitude of the vector V is square root of 5. Find the coordinates of terminal point Q such that the mag... Okay, this one might be interesting, actually. So it says, again, vector v has initial point 1 comma 0 and terminal point q that is on the y-axis and above the initial point. 
on the y-axis means, okay, so p is given as 1 comma 0. And q is on the y-axis, that means x is equal to 0. And I guess I'll call it, uh, what should I call it? I guess I'll call it uh, qy is currently unknown. Find the coordinates of terminal point Q such that the magnitude of the vector V is square root of 5. So vector V equals the vector pointing from P to Q and the magnitude of V equals 5. So magnitude of v being 5, that means 5 equals the square root of, let's see, the x component of pq squared plus the y component squared. So the x component, well, let me write what pq is supposed to be. pq is supposed to be equal to... zero minus one, that's negative one, and then for the y component, it's gonna be qy minus zero, so whatever this qy is. Okay, and then from there we can say negative one squared plus qy squared. Square root of is 5, so if I just square both sides, then I get 25 equals 1 plus qy squared. Subtract the 1 and take the square root. qy is equal to plus or minus the square root of 24. They said that... They said that it's on the y-axis and above the initial point. That means that it's the positive uh, square root. It's somewhere on the positive y-axis. Okay, and I guess I can simplify this a little bit. So 24 is 4 times 6. Square root of 4 is 2, so that becomes 2 root of 6. So equals two square root of six. And I don't see any questions in the chat. I don't know if, well, it doesn't look like anybody's in the chat anymore, so I guess maybe they didn't hear me when I replied or whatever the case may be. Well, maybe they'll come back later. No worries, I'll just continue with what I have. Hmm. So that was 13. 14 is similar, so I'll skip it. For the following exercises, use the given vectors A and B and for part A, determine the vector sum A plus B and express it in both the component form and by using the standard unit vectors. Part B, find the vector difference and express it in both component form and standard unit vectors. Part C, verify that vectors A, B, and A plus B, and respectively A, B, and A minus B satisfy the triangle inequality 
and part D determine the vectors 2a negative b and 2a minus b. Hmm. I think part C would be the most interesting part here. Verify that the vectors a, b, and a plus b, and respectively a, b, and a minus b, satisfy the triangle inequality. Well, let's start off a new sheet. Let's start off with a new sheet. And then the vectors that were given are under problems 15 and 16. I'll just do one of them. So 15 gives us a equals 2 i hat uh, plus j hat. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna do uh, I'm gonna do 16 instead because 16 actually has some negatives in it. We might as well grapple with them now. So, changing my mind for 16, a is just 2 i hat, while b is negative 2 i hat plus 2 j, negative 2 i hat plus 2 j hat. So they wanted us to find the vector sum and the vector difference, and then for part C, verify that they satisfy the triangle inequality. Okay, let's find the sum and difference first. So let's find A plus B and A minus B. Well, if they're written in terms of standard uh, unit vectors, then you can just treat it as uh, a combining like terms problem. So you've got 2 i hat plus negative 2 i hat plus 2 j hat. You can group the i hat terms and that's 2 plus negative 2 is 0 i hat, leaving you with just 2 j hat. Or if you prefer, uh, 0, 2. And then for a minus b, same deal. 2 i hat minus negative 2 i hat, that's going to be 4 i hat. And then minus positive 2 j hat, so minus 2 j hat. Or if you prefer, uh, component form, we can do 4, comma, negative 2. All right, let me see what the question was again. Verify that the vectors a, b, and a plus b satisfy the triangle inequality and then do it again between a b and a minus b okay so the triangle inequality is the observation that for a triangle for any triangle uh, let's call these sides i guess we'll call them a b and c The triangle inequality is the observation that a plus b must be greater than or equal to c, and that b plus c must be greater than or equal to a, and that c plus a must be greater than or equal to b.
So here, I guess we're going to do that for the magnitudes of these vectors. Prove that the magnitudes of the vectors satisfy the triangle inequality. So I guess I'm going to want to come up with the uh, magnitude of A, magnitude of B, magnitude of A plus B, and magnitude of A minus B. Magnitude of A, well that one's easy, that's just 2 because there's nothing else. It's the square root of 2 squared plus 0 squared, so just 2. Magnitude of B is going to be square root of negative 2 squared plus 2 squared. 4 and 4, that's 8. Square root of 8 or 2 square root 2, if you simplify. A plus B is just 2 J hat, so very similar to A, you've got the square root of 0 squared plus 2 squared, square root of 4, which is just 2 again. And then for A minus B, we have 4 and negative 2, so square root of 4 squared plus negative 2 squared. That's 16 plus 4, we did this before, it's square root 20, which simplifies to 2 root 5. And now we can test the triangle inequality and see if it holds. And we don't actually need a calculator to make our comparisons. We don't actually need a calculator. So... For addition, if I want to compare 2, 2 root 2, and 2, I see that 2 plus 2 root 2 is easily greater than uh, 2, so check. Uh, 2 root 2 for b plus 2 for c is greater than or equal to 2 for a, so that's another check. And then a plus b and a, 2 plus 2, is greater than or equal to 2 root 2. 2 plus 2 is 4, and 4 would be 2 times 2, so 2 times the square root of 2 must be less than 2 times 2. So, yeah, I can make the comparison without even having to bring out a calculator. So that's for a, B, and A plus B. Now we're going to do it again for A, B, and A minus B. This one is going to be a little bit trickier, but not too terrible. So first we're going to try A and B compared to A minus B. So 2 plus 2 root 2. Is that greater than or equal to uh, 2 root 5? Let's see, 2 plus 2 root 2 versus 2 root 5. Hmm, I guess this one is trickier without a calculator, but I still argue that it can be done. So 2 plus 2 root 2, well, it's a little more than 4. It's a little more than 4 but 2 root 5 is also a little more than 4 because root 5 is more than root 4. 
If it was 2 root 4, it would have been 4. So 2 root 5 is a little more than 4. Hmm. Then how do I want to argue for this? I guess what I can do is I can factor out the 2 and say 2 times 1 plus the square root of 2 greater than or equal to 2 times the square root of 5. I can cancel the 2's is 1 plus the square root of 2 greater than or equal to the square root of 5. I could just square both sides to prove this. If I square both sides, then I get, I'm comparing 5 to, let's see, if I square 1 plus root 2, then that's just a, uh, that's just a binomial that I'm squaring, so I'm going to get 1 squared plus 2 times 1 times root 2, so plus 2 root 2 plus uh, square root of 2 squared is 2. Let's see, so that's 1 plus 2, that's 3. And if I subtract 3 from both sides, then I'm comparing 2 root 2 to, let's see, 5 minus 3 would be 2, and 2 root 2 is definitely greater than or equal to 2. So, yeah, can be done without a calculator. Clearly it would have been faster to just type the numbers into a calculator, but the point is you're not stuck if you happen to be taking a course where a calculator is not allowed and a lot of calculus courses are non-calculator, especially in college. I don't remember how many classes I even had where the use of a calculator was expected. It was really rare, at least for me, but it, your mileage may vary depending on what university you go to. But anyway, we have at least checked uh, that magnitude of A plus magnitude of B is greater than magnitude of A minus B. So that's our first check. And next up, we want to do second and third compared to the first. So uh, 2 root 2 plus 2 root 5, 2 root 2 plus 2 root 5. Is it greater than or equal to uh, A, which is just 2? Magnitude of A, yeah, which is just 2. Uh, this one should be pretty easy to show. If you divide everything throughout by 2, then you're left with root 2 plus root 5 greater than or equal to 1, which is very easily seen because square root of 2 on its own is greater than or equal to 1. So if you're adding the square root of 5 to it, then uh, that's... That just makes the inequality ever more true. And our third comparison, third magnitude plus first magnitude, is it greater than or equal to the second one? So that would be the 2 root 5 is the 2 root 5 plus uh, the 2 greater than or equal to the 2 root 2. 2 root 5 on its own is greater than 2 root 2 because root 5 is greater than root 2, so yeah. Only the first one of these comparisons proved to be the most difficult. Continue. What other types of questions do we have here? 17. Let A be a standard position vector with terminal point negative 2, comma negative 4. And let B be a vector with initial point 1, comma 2 and terminal point negative 1, comma 4. Find the magnitude of vector negative 3 a plus b minus 4i hat plus j hat. Eh, I think we can skip that one. 
18, similar thing. Well, I guess I want to talk about uh, when they say let a be a standard position vector with terminal point negative 2, comma negative 4, uh, that just means that the initial point is the origin. But I think we can safely skip 17 and 18. What does 19 say? Let u and v be two non-zero vectors that are non-equivalent. Consider the vectors a equals 4u plus 5v and b equals u plus 2v defined in terms of u and v. Find the scalar lambda such that vectors a plus lambda b and u minus v are equivalent. And then 20 is similar, but with two unknowns to solve for instead of one. Uh, let's do number 20. Let me see, grab another sheet. U and V are non-zero vectors that are non-equivalent. So U does not equal V. That's what equivalent vectors are. They're just vectors that are equal to each other. And for vectors to be equal to each other, they're, each of their components have to match. So let U and V be two non-zero vectors that are non-equivalent. Consider the vectors a equals 2u minus 4v and b equals 3u minus 7v. So a equals 2u uh, minus 4v and b equals 3u minus 7v defined in terms of u and v find the scalars alpha and beta such that vectors alpha a plus beta b and u minus v are equivalent so alpha a plus beta b is equal to u minus v. Now the vectors u and v are unknown. Hmm. Let's see if we can find I'm not entirely sure where to start with this one, but I guess that's what makes it a good problem. Well, I guess I'll start with just distributing the alpha and the beta over A and B. So alpha A plus beta B is equal to 2 alpha u minus uh, 4 alpha v. Just multiplied this by alpha plus beta b is going to be, if I multiply by beta, I get 3 beta u minus, that's going to be 7 
beta v. And that's supposed to equal u minus v. And that is supposed to equal u minus v. So if I try to group like terms, then I've got 2 alpha plus 3 beta, 2 alpha plus 3 beta times u plus, and then for my v's, I've got negative 4 alpha minus 7 beta, negative 4 alpha minus 7 beta times v. And that's supposed to equal u minus v. So I can actually eliminate u and v because I can just say that uh, 2 alpha plus 3 beta, 2 alpha plus 3 beta must equal 1, right? There's a 1 in front of the u that we usually don't write. And then negative 4 alpha minus 7 beta, negative 4 alpha minus 7 beta must equal the v has a negative 1 in front of it. And I guess we can cancel all the minus signs if we wanted to. And now it's just a system of equations with two unknowns. Two equations with two unknowns. We can solve for that as long as the equations are not multiples of each other, which does not appear to be the case here. So I'll take the first equation and multiply it by 2. Take the first equation, multiply it by 2, and add it to the second. That would give me 4 alpha minus 4 alpha is 0, and then 6 beta minus 7 beta is negative beta, and then 2 times 1 is 2, plus negative 1 is 1, so beta equals negative 1. And I can plug that back in. I guess I'll plug it in over here. So 2 alpha plus 3 times negative 1 equals positive 1. And negative 3, if I add 3 to both sides, then that gives me 2 alpha equals 4. Divide by 2 and alpha is equal to 2. Okay, that wasn't too terrible. says consider the vector a of t equals cosine of t comma sine of t with components that depend on a real number t. As the number t varies, the components of a of t change as well, depending on the functions that define them. Write the vectors a of 0 and a of pi in component form. Show that the magnitude of a of t remains constant for any real number t. As t varies, show that, show that the terminal point of vector a of t describes a circle centered at the origin of radius 1. And I think I'll skip on this one. What about 22? a of x equals x comma square root of 1 minus x squared with components that depend on a real number, so kind of the same ordeal here. I mean, we've seen circles so many times, so that's why I skipped 21, but 22 might actually be interesting. Let's 
let's see, write the vectors a of 0 and a of 1 in component form. Show magnitude remains constant for any real number x, does it? Oh, yeah, I can see that. And show that it describes a circle again. Okay, yeah, I see the circle. Eh, we'll pass. 23 and 24 look like they're related. I'll just pass on those. As long as you know how to calculate magnitude and you know your trig and your unit circle, I don't think you're going to have trouble with questions like those. So I'd rather just move on to other stuff. For the following exercises, find vector v with the given magnitude and in the same direction as vector u. I'll do one of these. It's not too complicated of a process, really. Let me see. I actually want to give this marker a try. So I guess I will do number 26 looks good. So we want a vector v of magnitude 3, and we want it to be in the same direction as u. We want it to be in the same direction as u, which is negative 2 comma 5. Okay, so how do we create a vector that's in the same direction of another vector while also controlling its magnitude? Really simple. Convert this to a unit vector. If we convert it to a unit vector, then we get a vector of magnitude exactly 1 that has the direction of u. Then take that unit vector and multiply it by whatever magnitude you desire and that becomes the new magnitude. So I'm going to do, uh, let's see, unit vector of u is just going to be u over its own magnitude. We did this before. So that's negative 2 comma 5 divided by the square root of the square of negative 2 is 4 plus the square of 5 is 25. So that's 1 over the square root of 29 distributed over this stuff. So that's going to be negative 2 over root of 29 comma positive 5 over root of 29. And then for our vector v, we want it to have a magnitude of 3 and the same direction as u, so we'll just take the unit vector in the direction of u multiplied by 3. So v is equal to 3 times negative 2 over root 29, comma 5 over root 29, equals negative 6 over root of 29 comma 15 over root of 29. And in case you are not convinced by this, that this is indeed a vector of magnitude 3, we can check its magnitude pretty easily. We can just Do Pythagorean theorem magnitude of v equals the square root of, let's see, uh, 6 squared is 36 over square root of 29 squared is 29 plus 15 squared is 225. over 29. Uh, 36 plus 225 
is uh, 250 to 61, it looks like. Fifty-five, yeah, two sixty-one over twenty-nine, and if I do two sixty-one over twenty-nine, let's see. Well, uh, thirty would actually, yeah, uh, ten times twenty-nine would be two ninety. Nine times twenty-nine would be twenty-nine less than two ninety. 29 less than 290, so 290 subtract 30 would take you to 260. Subtract 29, then would take you to 261. So yeah, 261 is actually nine times two, nine times 29. So this simplifies to square root of nine, which is equal to three. Would have been easier with a calculator, of course, but uh, you're not completely helpless. Uh, when you uh, don't have your calculator. You can still do long division or you can uh, just do what I did and just to make the division easier treat the 29 like a 30 and see uh, what happens with a nearby multiple of 30 first. All right. Next up, what do I want to do? This group of exercises says, for the following exercises, find the component form of vector u given its magnitude and the angle the vector makes with the positive x-axis. Give exact answers when possible. Uh, I think I'll pass on that. Anyone who's uh, seen me do physics has seen plenty of that already. You just take the given magnitude, multiply by the sine and cosine of the angle, and decide which component is which. In this case, the angle is made with the x-axis, which means the cosine will give you the x-component. If it was the angle with the y-axis, then cosine would have given you the y-component. Aside from that, nothing new, at least not to my physics students. Not that this is necessarily for my physics students, but if you've seen my other videos, you've seen me do that type of calculation plenty of times for physics. Uh, next one says, from the following exercises, vector u is given, find the angle theta that vector u makes with the positive direction of the x-axis in a counterclockwise direction. That we've also done plenty of times in physics, so in two dimensions it's easy enough. All you have to do, for example, I guess I'll just do it on this one over here. At uh, the angle made with the horizontal for the vector uh, u equals negative 2 comma 5. All you would have to do is say, well, I guess I'll draw it somewhere. I guess I'll draw it over here. So negative 2 comma 5. That means it's 2 in the x direction and 5 in the y direction something like that. And we want the angle that it makes with the positive direction of the x-axis in a counterclockwise fashion. So actually they want this angle right here, which I guess adds some extra steps to it, but it's not too bad. So to get this angle, what you would want to do is calculate this angle first and then subtract from 180. So let's see, if this is the 5, 
and this is the two, just basic trigonometry here, then the tangent of this angle is uh, 5 over 2, so if I do inverse tangent of 5 over 2, it gets me this angle, and then the angle that they actually want is going to be 180 minus that. So the desired angle is 180 minus the inverse tangent, or arc tangent, if that's what you want to call it, of 5 over 2. And the fact that the 2 is negative is not really going to be relevant here. Uh, we already accounted for the negative nature of the 2 in our drawing. The 2 being negative is the reason we have to subtract from 180. If it was a positive 2, then our vector would have looked like this instead. And then this would have been our angle and we just would have done the inverse tangent of 5 over 2 and we would have been done. So the negative has already been accounted for uh, by the fact that we're subtracting from 180, uh, assuming you're working in degrees. If you are working in radians, then you would do pi minus inverse tangent of 5 over 2. And I see both degrees and radians in these problems, so you'll have to switch between the two modes often. And that's how you would go about doing problems like 35 and 36. 37, let's see, it says A is equal to components A1 and A2, components of B are B1 and B2, components of C are C1 and C2. Uh, assuming there are three non-zero vectors. If a1, b2 minus a2, b1 does not equal zero, then show there are two scalars, alpha and beta, such that c equals alpha a plus beta b. Hmm, this one might actually be worthwhile. None of these are zero. These do not equal zero. If a vector is equal to zero, by the way, that means all of its components are zero. Probably obvious, but remember that it can be easy to forget in the heat of the moment, sometimes for trick questions it is an important fact to take advantage of. So it says if a1, b2 minus a2, b1 does not equal zero, then show there are two scalars, alpha and beta, such that c equals alpha a plus beta b. So we are stating that a1, b2, a1, b2 minus a2, b1 does not equal zero implies that c can be written as some multiple of a plus some multiple of b. Hmm. 
Not entirely sure where to go with this, but that's often the nature of proof problems. Just start by writing things and see what you discover, which is exactly what I'm going to do. So if c equals alpha a plus beta b, then I can say that the components of c, I guess another way of writing this is c1 comma c2 has to equal, I'll distribute the alpha and say this is alpha a1 comma alpha a2 plus beta b1 plus, or no, not plus, comma, beta b2, which can be simplified further. So this is basically two relationships. It's telling us c1 is equal to the sum of alpha a1 and beta b1 equals alpha a1 plus beta b1 and c2 equals alpha a2 plus beta b2 Hmm. Show that there are two scalars, alpha and beta, such that c is equal to alpha a plus beta b. So we're not finding what those scalars are, we're just showing that they do exist. Well, if, if these are non-zero vectors that we're talking about, then How can I take advantage of that? And I'm still not seeing, also, to keep in mind is I'm still not seeing how this expression ties into it at all. a1, b2 minus a2, b1 is not equal to 0. What would happen if it is 0? Hmm. scalars alpha and beta such that this is true. If a1 times b2 minus a2 times b1 does not equal 0, what is that telling us? I guess what that's telling us is that vectors a and b are not multiples of each other? Hold on. I think I might be onto something. What if I were to multiply, let's see, if a1 b, a1 b2 minus a2 b1 does not equal 0, let me try and dig into the meaning of this a little bit more. So I guess we're trying to say if if a equals, I guess we'll call the constant k times b. If a is equal to some constant times b, if a is just a 
scalar multiple of b, then that would mean a1 comma a2 would equal just kb1 comma kb2 which would then mean that a1b2 minus a2b1 equals a1 can be replaced with kb1, so it would equal k b1, b2, minus a2 would be kb2, so it would be k b2, and then times b1 would equal 0. So yeah, a1, b2 minus a2, b1 does not equal 0 means that vectors a and b are not, uh, the official term is parallel to each other, are not constant multiples of each other. I feel like they want something else though. Like, I can, I can see what they're trying to say. Like, my brain has already skipped to the conclusion but I'm still stuck on kind of how to get there in an elegant fashion, I guess. two scalars alpha and beta such that c is equal to alpha a plus beta b. No matter what c is, no matter what the components of c are, they can be written as some multiple of a plus some multiple of b. Hmm. I'm not really sure where to go from here yet. by contradiction. I think that's essentially what I've done over here. Yeah, I think that's what I want to try and do. If A1, B2 minus A2, B1 did equal zero, then
I guess we could say a1 b2 equals a2 b1 and divide what do I want to divide here? Do I want to divide the b's or the a's? Hmm. I guess uh, what I'll do is I'll divide b1 over to the left and divide b2 over to the right then a1 over b1 equals a2 over b2 equals some constant k, which would then imply that a is equal to some constant times b, which would which would mean that the two vectors are parallel to each other. So yeah, by all this, This would tell us that A is parallel to B. And if A is parallel to B, then parallel to B, then the only way then C equals alpha A plus beta B is really just C equals alpha a plus I guess it would be hmm, if k is the ratio of a over b then I would actually want to write this as c equals k alpha times b plus beta times b, I don't even know where I'm going with this, equals k alpha plus beta all times b. k alpha plus beta, that's just a constant. So this would imply then that C is parallel to B, and if C is parallel to B and B is parallel to A, then C is parallel to A. So this implies that C is also parallel to A. So I guess the conclusion from this is nothing that I didn't already know. It's just saying that if a1 b2 minus a2 b1 was equal to zero, then the only way this would work is if c was parallel to a and b. But that's not exactly the same as proving that when a and b are not parallel, you can express any vector c as a sum of some constant times a plus some other constant times b. Hmm. Where do I go from here? I'm thinking I'll just leave this one for now and think and reflect on it and come back later just in the interest of time. Or maybe I'll come up with something while doing another problem. So. I'll go ahead and look for something else to do. I'll hold on to this page so that I don't write over it by accident.
And let me actually number it. So it was problem uh, 37 on page 118. So this was 37 on page 118. I'll look into it later if I don't come up with anything before the end of this session. Okay, let's have a look at another one. Thirty-eight says consider vectors a equals two comma negative four and b equals negative one comma two and zero. Determine the scalars alpha and beta such that c equals alpha alpha a plus beta b. Hmm, this time we actually have numbers. Oh, and does it tie into number 37? Determine the scalars alpha and beta such that C equals alpha A plus beta B. Yeah, they don't even mention C in this problem, so are they referring to the previous problem? Or maybe they forgot to type C equals zero is probably what they were going for. Okay, yeah, this problem, it's, it doesn't really tell me what it wants me to do. There's almost a problem here, but I'm not sure what it is. That's probably an error in writing the textbook. Skipping over, let's see what 39 says. Let P equal, or let the point P be X0 comma F of X0. Be a fixed point on the graph of the differential function F with a domain that is the set of real numbers. Determine the real number Z0 such that point Q, which is X0 plus one comma Z0, is situated on the line tangent to the graph of f at point p and determine the unit vector u with initial point p and terminal point q. Hmm. I'm going to have to read that again. So we have a fixed point on the graph of some differential function with a domain that is the set of real numbers. I think they might have meant differentiable function implying that the function is smooth. Determine the real number z0 such that point q is situated on the line tangent to the graph of f at point p. and determine the unit vector with initial point P and terminal point Q. So I guess this would actually use some calculus. So I would do I would find the line tangent to the graph of F at point P. So I would do x0 comma, I guess f prime of x0. Yeah, I'll think on this one later. I think I just want to move on to more standard problems for now, and I'll look through these on my own time, and if there are any interesting ones, I'll note them and cover them in a later session. 
I'd like to kind of keep the momentum going here, especially after uh, the time we spent on that last big problem. Uh, don't want to do 41 or 42. Let's see, 43 says, calculate the coordinates of point D such that ABCD is a parallelogram with A being 1 comma 1, B is 2 comma 4, C is 7 comma 4. I guess there the idea is to take advantage of one of the vector addition rules, which is the parallelogram rule. I don't think I'll actually uh, work it out, but I will go over the idea that they're hinting at with this. So we have some parallelogram uh, one, one, two, four, and seven, four. Okay, I think I've got the idea. So a parallelogram that looks like this, A, B, and C, whoops, capital B. And then we're looking for the location of point D such that a parallelogram is formed. And what you can do is say the vector from A to B plus the vector from B to C is the vector from A to C. This vector, although I kind of drew it not so straight, is equal to the sum of those two vectors. And also you could do this vector plus a is equal to that same sum. So you could do, let's see, I guess we'll call this vector ab and this vector bc. I mean, you can already do this without any, uh, without any vector stuff at all. You can just use your uh, coordinate geometry to do this if you remember your coordinate geometry. If you don't remember it, then uh, this course will definitely have you doing some coordinate geometry in three dimensions, no less. So this would be AB plus BC. And also this over here, this vector AD could also be added to AB. So basically the idea is that AB, AB plus BC is equal to uh, AB AB plus AD is equal to AB plus AD, which then implies you can cancel AB on both sides and say BC is equal to AD. BC is the change from B to C. So whatever that change is, the same change exists between A and D. So once you get vector BC, you can just add it to, I guess you can add it to the point A to figure out where the point D is. Not really the best problem considering you have so many ways to do it without having to rely on vectors, but they intended for you to do it using uh, vector ideas. Okay, moving on.
skip 44, skip 45. Hmm. Well, I guess a lot of these are application problems from here on out. Okay, then I'll go ahead and pick one. How about 51? 51 says three forces act on an object. So let me wall that off. 51 says three forces act on an object. Two of the forces have the magnitudes of 58 newtons and 27 newtons and make angles 53 degrees and 152 degrees respectively with the positive x axis. Find the magnitude and direction angle from the positive x axis of the third force such that the resultant force acting on the object is zero. So we've got three vectors, and we need them to add up to zero. So I'll just call them A and B and C, A and B and C, all need to add up to zero. And I didn't see any three-dimensional vectors here. Oh, I see it now the next section is going to be vectors in three dimensions. Well, that explains it. Hmm. So A1 or AX, if that's what you want to call it, comma a y plus b x comma b y plus c x comma c y has to equal zero. If you know your physics you can do it without all this stuff but we're trying to learn about vectors here using this uh, new notation that the physics students haven't seen yet. So let's try and do it using these newer methods. 58 and 27 are the magnitudes of A and B. So magnitude of A, 58, Magnitude of B, 27. And I guess the angles, I'll call them theta A, is 53 degrees. And theta B is 152 degrees from the x-axis. Okay, if I were to draw a coordinate system just to get a get an idea of that 152 degrees, that would look something like this. That would be 152 degrees. Or if you subtract from 180, that would be 28 degrees with the negative x-axis. So <clears throat> we can go ahead and just get the components. If we know the magnitude and angle made with the x-axis, then the components are just going to be uh, AX equals magnitude of A times cosine of theta A and Ay is going to be magnitude of A times sine of theta A. And we can do something similar for finding 
bx and by using theta b. So if I go ahead and try to solve for those ax, I'm going to actually need my calculator here. We've got magnitude of a was 58, so 58 times, and should I be in, yeah, degree mode. So 58 times cosine of 53 is about 34.905, 34.905, give or take. A y is going to be 58 times sine of 53 is 46.321 approximately, 46.321, that's for AX and AY, and then for BX and BY I'm going to do similar calculations, for BX I'm going to do one. 57 times cosine of 152 and that gives me negative 23.8395 so I'll round that to 8 point, er, 0.840 so negative 23.840 if you had used cosine of 28 degrees instead you would have gotten the same number except positive and you would have to remember to add in the negative yourself from the fact that your vector is going to be somewhere in the uh, second quadrant well I mean it's not going to be in the second quadrant because like we said earlier vectors don't actually have a location in space that they occupy but if you did draw it with its uh, initial point at the origin then it would land in the second quadrant as long as you recognize that its x component needs to be negative that's the important thing Otherwise, the way you go about it, whether you use cosine of 152 or cosine 28, shouldn't matter as long as you know what you're doing. By is going to be 27 sine of 152. If you use sine of 28 instead, sine of 152 is equal to sine of 128. So either way, you get 12.676 is what I will round it to. Okay, and the rest should be pretty simple from there. So we will have the sum of a, b, and c is zero. And like we said earlier, the zero vector is zero in all of its components. So that means that the uh, x component of this sum, ax plus bx plus cx, that needs to be zero, and also the y components need to add up to the y component of zero, which is zero. Zero is a vector for which all the components are zero. Okay, we know ax and bx, we can uh, plug them in and solve for cx, same deal for a, Y, and B, Y. Plug them in and solve for C, Y. I might as well do it since we have the numbers. We went to the trouble of calculating them. So 34.905 plus negative 23.840 is positive 11.065. These two add up to 11.065. So that tells me then that C, X has to be negative 11.065 approximately. And then for AY plus BY, 46.2 or 3 to 1 plus 12.676 
gives me 58.997. Did I type it in correctly? 46, 321, 12, 6, 7, 6. Yep, that all looks fine. So CY is equal to, or no, not CY, AY plus BY is equal to 58.997. This stuff is 58.997. Which means CY is negative 58.997. Approximately, because we did round. I mean, we had to round. It's not like we had that much of a choice. And there we have it. We might have time to squeeze in one or two more. Are there any good ones here, or should I start taking problems from the next section? I mean, there are probably good ones, but will I be able to recognize that at a glance? That's more of the same. So more of the same. Mm. Yeah, they're all just adding or subtracting vectors or setting them to a sum and solving for the missing value. I think we're good. I did enough of this with physics, so if you're not a physics student and you happen to find this uh, recording and you actually want to practice more problems like the one I just did, then you might want to look at my uh, physics videos that involve uh, force problems, which I don't think I've actually dedicated an office hours session to as of yet, but that's because I already have some uh, force videos. Uh, one of them can be found well, it's unlisted, but you'll find the link to it under one of my AP Physics review streams on YouTube. Yeah, I'm just going to move on to the next section. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Okay, let's see what we have here. So that's, yeah, section 2.2. First problem says, consider a rectangular box with one of the vertices at the origin as shown in the following figure. If point A, 2, 3, 5 is the opposite vertex to the origin, then find the coordinates of the other six vertices of the box and the length of the diagonal of the box determined by the vertices O and A, where O is the origin. Hmm. The coordinates of the other six vertices of the box, they're really going to... I mean, it's not hard, it's just... It's a lot of work. Okay, let me grab a new page and get us started on this. So they do have a drawing of it. I'm not sure how well I'll be able to replicate it. 
I guess I'll draw the box first and see if that helps at all with my drawing skills. So we have this box. And then we have our coordinate system. I guess I'll do that in pink. Actually, let me draw the uh, other edges of the box. OK, I did that badly. Should have looked like that. Yeah, that's better. Okay, and we have the z-axis over here. We have our x-axis over here. And we have our y-axis over here. got this point over here, this point A. Point A is at 2, comma 3, comma 5. That is, it's two spaces away along the x-axis. It is uh, three spaces away along the y-axis, and it's five spaces away along the z-axis find the coordinates of the other six vertices of the box. That's the first part. Find the coordinates of the other six vertices. Okay, so I guess what we'll do is over here we are moving parallel to the y direction so this point would have to be y goes from 3 to 0, so that's going to be 2 comma 0 comma 5. This point over here would be, so I guess we're going away from the x-axis this time, so that's x going from 2 to 0, so that's going to be 0 comma, and then y and z stay the same, 3 and 5. If we go down this way, then we are decreasing in z. So that's going to be from 2, 3, 5. We just go to 2, 3, 0. z goes from 5 to 0. 2, 3, 0. OK. And then from each of those points, we can make yet another move. So we can move either from 0, 3, well, yeah, we can move from 0, 3, 5 either to here or to here. Uh, 2, 3, 0 can move to here or to here. And from 2, 0, 5 we can move to here or to here. I'll just kind of do a bit of a rotation and move uh, to one of those points from each of the other points. So I'll move from 2, 0, 5 to here. I'll move from 0, 3, 5 to here. And I'll move from 2, 3, 0 to here. But you do have options. If you don't like the way I do it, then feel free to do it some other way. So from 205, I want to move, it looks like, in the opposite of the direction of the x-axis. So it looks like x is going to be going from 2 to 0. So over here, from 205 to 0, 0, 5. Okay, and then from 0, 3, 5, I want to go down to here. Going down this way, we're moving against the z-axis, so z is decreasing. 
from 5 to 0. 0, 3, 5 becomes 0, 3, 0 if we move to here. And from 2, 3, 0 I want to move to here, so we can do... What is that? We're moving against y, so we'll decrease the 3, and that takes us to 2, 0, 0. All right, and we've labeled all, well, and then there's the last vertex there, which is at 0, 0, 0. That's the origin, 0, 0, 0. Part B says, find the length of the diagonal of the box determined by the vertices O and A. Find the length of the diagonal. So if I were to draw a line from here to here, what is the length of this line? What is the length of that? So that line makes a right triangle with this segment and this segment over here. And that would be the right angle. The right angle would be over there. OK. So this L is going to be equal to I guess this distance is going to be equal to the square root of this distance squared plus this distance squared. So this distance from A to here, that's not going to be too hard to figure out. That's just going to be the distance from 230 to 235. Uh, that's just going to be 5. You just move 5 steps up. So this we already know is 5. Probably not the best color choice here. What about this distance? Well, this distance we don't know yet. I guess I will call it, uh, what do I want to call it? I guess I'll call it R. And we can calculate this R by drawing yet another right triangle. So. I'll do this actually in the yellow color, since the yellow doesn't uh, I'm struggling to find the right word. The yellow doesn't overshadow the other colors too much. So we're going to draw this right triangle over here. You could also draw the one over there in the back, but I prefer to draw this one. I can't even tell if we can see that yellow very well, considering how dark all the surrounding colors are, probably not. This would be the right angle right here. And for that, we can figure out what these two sides are. So I'm going to switch back to gray. This side is just going to be I guess we can do the distance from 200 to 230 is just a distance of 3 along the y-axis. And then that distance over there is the distance from 200 to the origin. That's just going to be 2. So r can be calculated from the Pythagorean theorem with 2 and 3. So I can do r squared is equal to 2 squared plus 3 squared. I'm going to keep it written like that. Now we need to solve for l squared was our original problem. l squared was equal to 5 squared plus that r squared. equals 5 squared plus r squared was 2 squared plus 3 squared. So this shows you that the Pythagorean theorem still works 
in three dimensions, which is good because this is what we're going to use to calculate the magnitudes of our vectors in three dimensions. If I have a vector, let's call it vector b, for example, with components bx, by, and bz, then the magnitude of b can be calculated by taking the square root of bx squared plus by squared plus bz squared. Just like how you would do it in two dimensions, just, add enough, just adding one more term under the square root. We're essentially calculating the length of the vector that points from the origin to point A. So 5 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, that's 25 plus 4 plus 9. 4 and 9 is 13. 13 plus 25 is 38. So that tells us that L is equal to the square root of 38. Can I actually simplify that? If I divide by 2, I just get 19. So no, it can't be simplified any further than this. All right, so not exactly a vector problem, but it's. I think you can see its importance. Hmm. I don't know, do we have time for one more, or should I wrap things up here? I think I will wrap things up here, and next time we'll just, unless some other idea comes to mind for me, I'll just continue where I left off. Well, I mean, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be reteaching myself all of this stuff so, waiting until the end of the week to cover more might not be the best idea. We'll see. Maybe I'll do more of these uh, office hours over the summer. That's not a promise. I'm considering some other options, like maybe just uh, doing a summer job. And that might take up more time and I have other projects that I want to work on so we'll see how it works out but I might stream a little bit more during the summer not a promise yet but we'll see what happens I'll come up with something to do next week maybe it'll be a continuation of this or maybe it'll be something uh, completely different and far ahead in the book but I think I'd be more interested in just continuing either way. Like, I mean, I can always just read ahead while reteaching myself this stuff and go back to wherever we left off for the office hours sessions. It's not like we have to do whatever I'm currently reviewing. But yeah, I'll give it some thought and figure out uh, how best to move forward with this. In all likelihood, we'll just be picking up where we left off and doing some more vector stuff. And I think that's all I have to say. So yeah, take care. And uh, if you have questions, make sure to show up and ask them whenever I do the next session, which will most likely be just the usual time next week. And uh, take care, and I'll see you then.